So welcome everyone. Uh, I understand we are now live. Apologies for that um, piece that uh, was stated before. So I will, uh, uh, my name is Randy Labonte and I'm the CEO of the Canadian eLearning Network. And we are here to talk a little bit about uh, pandemic pedagogy and the models and successes in our country that have seen some success and others. There's a lot of comparisons that we can make to what's happened in other countries as well, certainly to the south of us. Uh, but I would like everyone to sort of just introduce themselves at this point in time. Uh, just bear with me in just a minute. Oops on that page. So uh, Michael Barber is in, in the room? Not yet. So next, uh, Joelle, do you want to say hello? Hi, I'm Joelle Nagel, and I'm a teacher educator at the Faculty of Education in Windsor, Ontario at the University of Windsor. And I will just cycle down the list. My name is Frank McCallum. I'm an administrator with Vista Virtual School. We're an entirely online asynchronous school based in Alberta, and I am specifically in the city of Calgary. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Canu. I'm located here in Montreal in the province of Quebec. I'm the CEO of Learn, and I'm glad to be here to join you today. To get to it. Okay, thank you both. Um, sorry, I just have to get the noise out because I was streaming the others uh, for that. So uh, Michael Barber will join us shortly, ho um, hopefully. Um, but just a little bit about us is that we're, uh, we came together actually uh, by meeting uh, at Anikal. I think uh, Michael Canuel was one of the founders who brought us together at the Anikal event. And uh, there was an interesting hi history that finally led us to, I think it was 2012 in Montreal that we met? Yeah, we, I think we, no, actually the first meeting we had was in Toronto, then the second one was in in, the, in Montreal. And that was 2013, I think that's when we decided it was a that's national right. organization. And we so we built that then, uh, and uh, through the support of some of our online programs, uh, this basically not because we don't like uh, our, our, our American neighbors to the south and that we don't learn with you and we continue with this is why we're at DLAC um, as well, but because we realized that we needed to support each other uh, in some of our unique conditions uh, in, in uh, Canada. So this network has uh, been built basically to connect and share uh, good practices, ideas. Uh, we have to also focus on professional learning opportunities uh, and research. Uh, and essentially we just want to be a voice uh, that will bring reason to online learning uh, and how it's viewed and what it actually is in Canada across all sectors in our country. Because as we've all experienced in the pandemic uh, is that emergency remote teaching, which then became remote learning uh, is not the same robust online learning that we've uh, come to know and build. So that's what our network is sort of for and about. So um, we also helped to bring understanding, and maybe Joelle, you can say a few words about this because Michael was going to, uh, about the pandemic series that we put together to try to track and monitor things that were stated and things that happened. So Joelle, why don't you say a few words about this? So we started um, collating um, our data right after um, the 2020 lockdown shutdown um, here across Canada in terms of in March, very quickly, all jurisdictions um, and territories moved to emergency remote learning. And so our series of um, reports build on what happened during that time um, you know, everybody was sort of thrust into, into this situation unknowing and um, without training or, or how to do this. And during that time, um, there was a, a lot of chaos and 
it was very different when schools opened up again in 2020 in September, where um, while people, kind, while our schools kind of went back face to face, there was still a lot throughout that year, the 2020-21, of moving back and forth, depending on our COVID cases between um, emergency remote and face to face, um, with Ontario being um, the one jurisdiction that had schools closed for the longest period of time um, altogether now up to 19 weeks. And so then again, we have the next year coming up this past year, um, this idea that everything is going to be back to normal, whatever that is, um, but still kind of, you know, trying to see how jurisdi jurisdictions um, are moving towards something that looks a lot different than emergency remote learning, but in very kind of difficult ways. So those are, are what our reports are kind of building on throughout this period. Uh, and I'll put you the link to the site in, in just a minute I, to manage my screens. But the top left is what uh, actually wasn't published first, but it was the base uh, that was uh, on which it was, we built sort of the whole series and programs. And so it was based on some, um, a, basically a post-secondary piece that was done. So we invited Charles Hall, Hodges and Phil Hill, et cetera, to, to publish that uh, as well with us to create that. And then, so then we had a series that went through the different timings uh, within that. And while we weren't providing commentary in these, it was more chronicling the events that occurred, what was publicly stated, what we pulled off of uh, websites, et cetera, et cetera. And then we actually uh, continued by publishing yet another, which is going to go there. <laughs> um, so we compiled sort of the first 18 months of this, uh, and now we're looking at building uh, a bit more of a reflective commentary about where we are and where we're going. So we also use this from um, Charter Hodges, et cetera, that looked at multiple phases of responses in, in sort of the pandemic. And the idea was that we did this rapid transition in first phase, which was just simply let's get out. I remember, um, you know, uh, scenes of teachers driving cars through neighborhoods for the elementary school, just saying, waving and honking. Uh, that was back when we used to honk for our medical professionals as well and, and ring pots, et cetera. Um, but then the idea was to be able to put some basics in there. So after the shutdowns, the rapid shutdowns, uh, as we all experienced uh, in, in the March of 2020 and leading into that, there's some basics that started to come in. We can do more than just that. Uh, so we need to add a few things. So that's really what was envisioned about that. Uh, and then the, the idea behind how this progresses is that we would actually move to a phase three where we're prepared to support uh, quick responses to uh, school shutdowns, whether for pandemic or in the case is in many places in, in the mid Northwest school days, which are quite prevalent back East. We, we don't have them on the West coast, but uh, there are school days that do occur uh, for folks that are not near the waters as much, uh, unless you're on the East coast. Um, but that really hasn't happened because what happened is we went back to, as we all know, we want to return to school. So let's focus on safety and et cetera. So we haven't really gotten into the emerging, emerging new normal as envisioned in this sort of piece. So what we did is we basically saw teachers take classroom pedagogy and practices, put them online, uh, Zoom school, if you will. So it really was about the word pivot really didn't exist because we didn't change pedagogy practice. All we did is changed where we pump and push a signal and it was technology and there are some rules that are different in each of our jurisdictions that we'll get into about how that actually worked because we know uh, you know in terms of online it's purposeful it's systematic in terms of how you administer develop courses support select tools you look at what the mediums actually offer for that and you provide specific training for teachers none of that happened so that's why the term remote learning is really critical for us so in the first year, uh, when we started back into the schools in Canada, several jurisdictions did offer remote learning. Uh, they wanted to keep class cohorts together. So they said, hey, you get to choose if your kid's going to stay at home, they're going to get connections to their classroom and their teacher. 
called remote learning, but that's the only way you can keep them in their cohort. Oh, and stay registered in our school in some cases. Uh, expectations around remote learning was it's full time. You commit to it when you're in the home. And it really lost any of that asynchronous kind of ability or independent ability, what was in there. It's still very teacher directed. And well, you know, some standardized testing still occurred, uh, generally speaking. Um, and the plans, wherever possible, in jurisdictions, they enhanced safety as, as, as everywhere. Uh, but uh, also, some jurisdictions specifically started the school year without offering remote learning. So it was either you were going to be in school or you're going to be enrolled in one of the online programs. And BC is a good example of that one, but did occur. And so they got away from this class cohort idea and they just said, we're going to keep our schools open. But uh, in BC, there was not provincial school closures. There were, specific, so there were specific individual school closures. So they never once had a provincial shutdown. And Joel, you mentioned that, I think already, in terms of that, uh, how things were, were shut down in Ontario. So it was a different situation wherever we go. So, but what did happen is we did see new learning models evolve, okay? So typically before pandemic, we started with just in-person and or distance and online. And Canada's had robust for distance education for over a hundred years uh, because of ge geography is a big factor that uh, plays in that. Uh, so it was either in school or it was online. But now with pandemic, we've got the whole in-person is started to bridge into the online uh, uh, area. So we've seen different pedagogical models come in, to, in from regular classroom to concurrent teaching that's occurring at the same time. So I broadcast into the classroom as well as broadcast online or hybrid in the true sense of it, where whereby it's it's where there's some individual time that's done outside of the classroom, uh, learning independently or and or there's group activities that occur in the classroom. So these are some of the models we're starting to see. And arguably, they're not really necessarily implemented to that phase three, where we're prepared to, to actually do the thing that was called pivot uh, in terms of learning uh, for, for that. So, so we're not really toggled, but there were some differences that did occur, and we'll get into the specifics with the panel. Uh, in Nova Scotia, they actually provided teacher training. They took a week, they closed the schools, uh, and they trained up their teachers. BC de delayed implementing its changes to online programs because they were encouraging everyone to go to them now. So they had to support them. And in Quebec, I think Michael will ask you about this, the Quebec, uh, about the Quebec online consortium that evolved in the context. So some jurisdictions closed individual schools, others locked down entire provinces. Some provided robust online learning programs and improved them. Others simply relied on remote learning where teachers, classroom teachers were on their own to figure out what to do. Uh, that all began with plans for in-person learning. But again, also what happened just in January is that most delayed uh, or opening or started with remote because of Omicron. So what did that do? Well, created an equitable learning experience and certainly and varied policies and plans and practices, only some of which we believe to be successful. So with that in mind, um, let's skip that one. I want to go to the national view and we'll start uh, is Michael Barber's not here. So we won't start with him. We are going to start with uh, the Newfoundland laboratory. We'll come back to that afterwards. Uh, Michael, here we go. Newfoundland over here and then Nova Scotia uh, here. Labrador is this little nice little piece up here that um, where Quebec is and Quebec will be this. Uh, we'll start with you, Michael. Uh, Quebec is uh, our French uh, province, bilingual through, Michael as well. Ontario, I'll fill in for Todd Pottle, who's unfortunately been uh, taken away for uh, health reasons, has traveled to a hospital that needed some testing done. And we'll go to Alberta with Frank and then also with BC. So uh, the, the focus that we're going to say uh, in each of our, our discussions here, and I'm going to take stop sharing and we'll get into the panel. Uh, it's one of the impacts of health measures. What were the challenges faced? What models were used during pandemic and which proved to be effective? What might are likely to continue? And other challenges that have cropped up now, because that's basically what we've been about uh, throughout this. So let me stop sharing there and let me go, uh, well, Mr. Barber is here. So Michael, if you were prepared, do you want to start with and tell us a little bit about Newfoundland Labrador in terms of what's happened during pandemic in that area? 
Sure. Yeah. Apologize for my uh, delay in arriving. I, we're dealing with a, a student uh, integrity issue that uh, has monopolized my day since about 9.15 when it came up. Um, so I missed uh, pretty much all of your introduction, save about the last five minutes. Uh, I, I can say that uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, I think, is like a lot of jurisdictions where um, while they had access to a lot of expertise in distance education because they had been actively doing it for the past, well, I guess, four decades now, if you count the old telemedicine model, the, the old audiographic system that they had. They had a provincial LMS that they could have used. They had pretty much all of the secondary content um, created as asynchronous courses broken down into one hour lessons. And throughout the entire pandemic, uh, that was rarely used, if at all. Um, in fact, the, the English school board, because in the province there's only two school boards, one English, one, one French one, uh, the English school board only late last month, I think it was on the 26th of January, announced that they were finally going to put a push on getting people to actually use this. And, you know, only 22 months into the pandemic, we're finally going to make these things available and known to folks, and we're going to support them the way in which we should have been for the last 22 months. Um, but so most, like most places, teachers were scrambling. Um, many of them were using Google Classroom tools as a part of their regular teaching anyway. So they just scrambled to try to create or curate some content uh, using those kinds of tools and left it at that. Um, but that's sort of a... a I, I, I'm taking away some of Michael's steam because Michael is normally the doom and gloom guy when it comes to these kind of things. So I, I'm just setting the stage for um, his uh, perspective on, on what's happening in Quebec. Want me to take my turn? Okay. Um, I didn't think I was a doom and gloom, I just the, the reality guy. Um, the, the truth of the matter is, I, if I speak Quebec, uh, the underlying uh, current really is anything but online. Um, when the pandemic started in the March uh, 2020 to the end of that school year in June, uh, they pretty much asked everyone to go online. However, there was no clear model, there was no clear approach, it was rather chaotic. They did ask, um, everyone to contribute so that they had a, a, a digital resource that became available to everyone. But again, very disorganized. They called on a university to uh, put together a program for teacher training, which um, still isn't complete yet. So it, it, that, the start was pretty poor. Um, when that school year ended, uh, they more or less decided that they would do everything they could in school year 2021 to keep schools open. And as a rule, most of them did stay open during the course of the year. There were some closures here and there for a week here, a week there. Some in the remote areas were closed. But uh, generally, all of these schools remained open um, with um, uh, recourse to online only when the, uh, the, uh, the situation got a little bit out of hand. The uh, school year uh, 2022, the current one, uh, again, the same policy was taken that, that they would try to keep all the schools open. They shut down some schools, uh, uh, the, the, the board, school boards before Christmas for a couple of weeks and then another, another week after. Um, uh, however, the, the general feeling is let's do everything we can not to do it online. And there are a number of reasons for that. It's simply because uh, when they, the teachers did go online, as everyone's heard, they were just simply not ready, not trained forced into a situation, uncomfortable with it all. Uh, Randy outlined a little bit of this. They asked to basically teach online and they were using their regular uh, um, classroom uh, uh, practice and it just didn't work. The other thing though that we're, we're, we've heard a lot from and a lot of bounce back are the parents. Um, typically in online situations, we've seen um, classes and we've been giving them since 1999. They've been in a controlled environment of sorts. When I say controlled, it was planned. Um, in the sense that parents knew that their child was going to be enrolled in an online class and uh, they were able to um, make the necessary arrangements. 
when suddenly everyone was asked to take their kids and put them online, uh, in many households, a whole number of things came up. Uh, uh, you had um, uh, uh, bandwidth issues, you had uh, uh, hardware issues, compatibility platforms. Um, and then on top of that, you, generally, if you had uh, two kids, three kids in, in the house, uh, it was chaos. Um, and so the parents uh, uh, really uh, resisted going back to uh, online. And as I said, not so much because it was poor uh, in all cases, because I don't want to be that negative and say it was all bad. It wasn't all bad. There were many, many uh, cases where the teachers were doing outstanding work and adapting uh, quite well. But for the parents, despite this, uh, the, the problem is that how do you deal with the uh, two kids, three kids, and my son has four, um, four kids doing online classes in, in a home, and uh, you still have a job to do, and uh, you're trying to uh, manage things. So um, for parents, it was really a question of how do I manage all of this? So there's been a, a real push to be in the classroom and to make things happen. Um, at the same time, what we've seen is uh, homeschooling in our province has gone up. Uh, the number of uh, parents who've taken their kids out of uh, the, the public school system and put them into uh, or taken them in for homeschooling soon because they were uncomfortable what was going on in the class. So those numbers have gone up. Uh, students going into the private schools, those numbers have gone up. And uh, this year, uh, even though the government's trying not to have online classes, they realized that there were many students who um, have medical exemptions, uh, the students with either uh, uh, immunosuppressed uh, conditions where they just couldn't allow them to be put into a, a class where uh, there was a possibility of infection or that they would uh, bring the infection home to uh, members of the family. They decided at the last minute uh, to, um, and then I say last minute, it was actually the beginning of September, they said put together a virtual school for our students with medical exemptions. Well, we, we managed to do that in a, in a rather... Uh, uh, let's say slapstick kind of uh, format at first until we were able to put some order to it. When the uh, government said that they, they were going to keep the schools open uh, even after um, uh, the, the height of the Omicron uh, wave, uh, we, we've had more students enroll in the, in the school for medical exemption, uh, students with medical exemptions. So we're seeing that uh, a lot of this is being driven by how parents are dealing with it or attempting to deal with this. So very often we're talking about one of the primary challenges um, for educators, but the, the, what we see here is that it's a lot of reaction from uh, parents who are simply saying, I just can't deal with it, I can't cope with it. At the same time, we, we had last spring um, a teacher's union come out and say how bad online learning is and uh, uh, without really any evidence to support that. So it, the powers that be are, are listening to uh, our teachers' unions, and they're listening, and, and, I, and I don't uh, questions about that, but I, I do sympathize with the parents who are pushed into a situation where they're asked to manage these things. So we, we, we found that um, uh, it has been a, quite a challenge. We're already trying to prepare for next year because we know that despite, uh, um, we keep being told that the, the, it's, the pandemic is becoming endemic, and we now see all kinds of restrictions uh, uh, being uh, removed, um, we strongly suspect there'll still be a, a need for um, a special service for students who were not able to uh, to attend regularly. So we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, offer a, another virtual uh, school for students with medical exemptions. So uh, again, a lot of challenges in just managing this, putting it together. Um, and one of the other things finally just, uh, end up is that because we work across many different school districts and boards, um, getting school boards to agree and collaborate is not so easy. Um, one board uses Google, the other one uses Teams, the other one really likes uh, Zoom. Um, so just from an IT perspective, getting everyone to collaborate and to coordinate is not so easy. We have a centralized um, uh, reporting system for attendance and uh, 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 exams, uh, scores on, on the of year of things so that's uh, again each school board and district does it differently so a challenge to get people to coordinate collaborate uh, uh it's just been ongoing we managed to get uh, some kind of semblance of order to it but uh, just getting people to collaborate in, a, in an environment in a time when they're not used to collaborating it remains a, a challenge i i am a little optimistic i think that uh, we because we were able to do things uh 
people are now looking at saying that there's a model and it can work and uh, we're hoping that the ministry and our government here will uh, open their minds and look at this as a, as a viable option in a controlled situation where parents are not being uh, put into a situation where they, they cannot manage or they're not expecting to uh, have to manage this kind of uh, reality for them. That wasn't too negative, Michael. No, it wasn't. He's just answering question for that Nikki uh, Revenau put in. And for those of you that are watching the recording and not checking the chat, so our question was, have any teachers unions in Canada advocated for online learning? And the answer is historically yes. Uh, and there's a, a collective agreement in Nova Scotia teachers that actually speaks to uh, online learning as well. So, Michael, I don't know if you want to add anything else, Mr. Barber? Um, we did actually a report, um, I'm trying to find it here and then I'll drop it in the link as soon as I have it, uh, that looked at uh, the union response. Yes, that's right. And um, you had, you know, examples like Franco, remember this in Alberta, uh, when the, the government was looking to make changes to the ADLC, I guess it was four or five years ago, um, the, uh, the Alberta Teachers Association came out and talked about how um, you know they were looking to try to maintain the funding that the the ADLC was uh, uh, getting, and um, you know so and we've seen number of locals in Ontario, local uh, um, members of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, that um, they're locals with the individual uh, branches that have had. A, items related to e-learning added into the contract at the local level to supplement the provincial contract, the provincial collective agreement. Um, so for the most part, and for that matter, the BCTF uh, has actually probably done more research into online learning than any other single body in the entire uh, country, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so they've, you know, funded a great deal of research. And, and while most of that was under the guise of one of their particular researchers, um, you know, it's a great collection of material. And it's always been sort of how, in most cases, the concerns that they raise have tended to focus around um, working conditions and work-life balance. So essentially knowing that the role of the distance ed teacher or the online teacher is different than the classroom teacher, what does that mean in terms of making sure that they have an equitable workload in comparison to their face-to-face -face counterparts? Yeah, and I put a link to a session we did two years ago, DLAC, to, which was on the contract language. So that's not the actual report, but that's the one that I dug out quickly for those of you that uh, are interested. Frank, do you want to speak to the Alberta Teachers Association, the union there? Yeah, and I mean, I don't know if you want, do we want to talk about Alberta and kind of skip over Ontario for a second? Well, let's just let the discussion roll. Yeah, because I mean, Michael brings up an interesting point, Michael Barber. Um, in Alberta, I would uh, kind of characterize the, the past three years as, as being one of um, constant change, which is not surprising, but by constant change, there were plans afoot for the education system, and the government here did not let a good pandemic get in the way. So we did have a centralized uh, provider of distance education resources, distance education instruction, and a de facto provincial LMS um, that was called the Alberta Distance Learning Center, or ADLC. In the 2019-20 school year, when this all started, of course, there was an entire systemic shutdown. Um, ADLC very much was a part of that a conversation with school boards to help get them on their feet to provide resources and expertise to deliver um, higher quality online education. Some divisions accepted that, uh, that offer, some did not. In the 2021 school year, so last school year, um, ADLC was scheduled to be shut down. And at the end of the school year, those plans were brought to their fruition. And so our centralized provider did actually shut down. Now in the background, Alberta has a lot of distance education expertise. We have about two and a half dozen online schools that have been doing um, synchronous and asynchronous delivery for many years. They continued very much um, on pace with what we've been doing. Our own school is one of them. And so when the ADLC shut down, 
Uh, certainly it caused a lot of consternation for a lot of schools and school divisions. The online schools just kind of soldiered on. Last year, again, there were a number of um, province-wide interruptions, I would say, as opposed to systemic shutdowns um, that caused uh, all sorts of issues in terms of are we going, are we not going, but there was always that central resource there that you could fall back to. This year, the 21-22 school year, of course, there is no centralized provider. There is no centralized de facto LMS for the province. There is also the resources that have been designed or built centrally are being held by our, uh, our provincial department of education and uh, apparently not being shared. So we don't know what the, the fate is of those. And at the same time, we don't see any sort of systemic interruption in, um, in education. We're seeing more of kind of what Randy referred to as little pockets. We were seeing individual school divisions have, um, have shutdowns for some period of time, individual schools. In some larger cities, we're seeing individual courses or individual classes have to move to online um, learning. So in a, in a school, you might only have two classes, but they moved to online because their um, absence rates are incredibly high. So it's been all over the place this year. It's been very chaotic. Uh, there is no sort of central resource to, to rely on. Um, so what's ended up happening is that teachers are relying on each other. There's a quite a network of contacts and conversations that happen at the teacher level. There's been no centralized provision of uh, uh, training in any meaningful way. Again, school divisions have very much taken on that, uh, uh, that job themselves. And in the background of all of this, there were also plans for curriculum changes in the province, and those curriculum changes march on full steam ahead for full implementation in the 22-23 school year. So the pandemic has just been part of a larger picture of what I would say is um, instability or chaos in the education system. But what I'm seeing is that teachers are very much um, developing their own networks, developing their own professional development networks, um, connections between schools, between school divisions to kind of share that expertise and to, to soldier on um, in that sort of granular situation. That's what's happening in Alberta. And just to kind of position it for you, Alberta would be directly north of Montana. So <laughs> where the borders go and coots. Um, the, uh, the ATA document link was put into the chat by Michael uh, with regards to their statement in terms of 2013 uh, for that as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, British Columbia, where I'm located, went in a different direction. I'll comment and save my comments for that until later because Joel, maybe what we can do is help uh, do Todd a service in terms of fill in for some of it. He did provide me with a couple of uh, slides. And so just let me share this one out. And Joel, because you were there personally and you lived it. So maybe tell us a little bit about what happened from March 20 through to January 2022 as Todd has put these bullets together. Um, okay, so obviously, I think in March 2020, as I think most everyone, um, our schools were shut down for the entire year. And I think save for BC that went back just in the last bit of June, um, everything was closed. And so then in 2020, um, in, the, in September, we were kind of opening up again. And there was a lot of, um, here in Ontario, a bit of unknown in how, what that was going to look like and um, our Ministry of Education kind of waited until the very end to kind of give any kind of instruction of what to do. And so a lot of um, the school boards were um, delayed in opening so that they could you know, figure out what they wanted to do in a plan. And for our secondary students across Ontario, they went to quad masters where um, instead of taking four courses, they took two. Um, for a two month period and half, and it was divided into cohorts. So half the cohort um, one week would be at home learning online and streaming into the classroom where their, the other cohort, their classmates were actually face to face. Um, and then they would switch up the weeks. And so for that whole year, the quad masters um, stayed in place. Um, and throughout the, um, that year, there was a lot of, you know, schools being closed um, because of outbreak and such or boards and by December the schools across um, the province were closed 
and then reopening um, in the winter of 2021, we were all closed until about mid-February. And so then going back to school again, but then by um, our March spring break, mid-March 2021, um, the entire province was closed and we didn't reopen again. And so, again, as I mentioned before, Ontario was the, the only jurisdiction that kept schools closed province-wide um, for as long as they did, and, and that's about 19 weeks. And so after that school closure this past school year um, for 2021-22, so schools kind of all reopened um, again, you know, for lack of a better terminolog terminology, is like business as usual. We're just going um, to keep what we're doing. Um, but because of, you know, our cases, depending, it became more localized as school boards um, would close or individual schools or then we would have cohorts. So a class within a school could be dismissed. And so there was a lot of jumping around. Um, and it was very disruptive, um, you know, all of a sudden you know, it was Thanksgiving day here and, and you get the call that somebody in the class um, for my son. So the entire class has been dismissed for, for a 10 day period. And so that was kind of like this rotation of classes that were um, shut down, then back and all that kind of thing. So it was fairly chaotic. And then after our, our Christmas break here, we were delayed as well for two weeks going back. Um, and so now we're all back again. And right now our, our testing has been changed. So we don't have to be monitoring that. And, and right now, I guess the goal is just to keep our classes open and our, our, um, our students in the classroom, regardless of what the environment is like. Um, the government, our, our ministry really also wanted to use online learning for our inclement weather days, which I think poses um, some, some problems in terms of when we have this emergency remote learning, um, there's this idea that students can have access to technology. Uh, we kind of did that really well during the first shutdown in 2020, but a lot of regions, even though, you know, we're trying to offer that because of technology and, and lack of tech, enough technology. A lot of students never really did going into the new school year um, have a lot of technology available. But when we're doing that for inclement weather days, then there's not the idea that, you know, will the students have access to technology? Will, you know, depending on the weather, do they have the connectivity or what's happening within that um, to just kind of move online as if there's this kind of seamless um, thing going on. But anyway, yeah. lots is, of chaos, I would suggest. Is my satellite dish full of snow so it doesn't work? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, thanks. It was interesting. There was um, um, an editorial cartoon uh, was in the newspaper that did get a few shares around in the social media of the leaders of the government of Ontario with the light switch. We're fully open, we're fully shut. We're fully open, we're fully shut. Whereas it was more distributed in other areas uh, across. Um, there were a few things as well that, that Todd did want to mention that did come out, not necessarily related to pandemic, uh, but you know, with the focus was certainly on, on health in schools as being a part of that. And Joel, you mentioned the modified cohorts, et cetera. But they also introduced for continuity and catching up or learning loss is that you know, summer school upgrading courses were used as well. And volunteer hours for uh, graduation requirements were uh, provided as well. Uh, so they did bring in some voluntary attendance um, that, through that, which is different uh, for that. But what's also interesting is now coming out of this, uh, there's, there's further work, I think, that is coming in, and I'm just going to share with you the, the link uh, for this, um, and just make sure I do have the right link on my, uh, because this is something, and maybe Mr. Barber might want to come back into this, so I'll just put the link in the chat area, is Ontario has announced now the, the program, the process that they're going to be following for mandatory, two mandatory e-learning courses that are required 
uh, for in there. Um, so Ontario, which is north of Michigan, all the way through north of New York, I think Buffalo is is you know the the uh, one of the favorite teams for Toronto because Toronto doesn't have an NFL football team, even though it's desperately trying to get it. We're coaxing uh, Buffalo to move up into Toronto, actually, but. I think about 50% of the people that go into Buffalo at a game is they're, they're from Ontario. So um, the what's 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 interesting about it is they first announced four. Now Michigan has, uh, and Michael Barber helped me out on this, Michigan has one mandatory e-learning required course, uh, and it's a policy decision as well. Uh, Ontario floated, floated a balloon for four that caused before pandemic a lot of consternation around what is online learning and what is this and who's doing it is it just correspondence, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That's now been rationalized down but uh, Todd, uh, who is coordinating uh, all the e learning consortiums uh, so boards of consorted in uh, consorted together to help support online courses in particular for secondary both in the francophone boards, there's 12 of them, but also in uh, now, I think of the 60 anglophone boards, I think Todd's got 35, but likely to be all of them. Now the government is starting to work with the boards collectively to find a process. And this is the link that I posted is about that. So Mr. Barber, maybe add some more in here with what's happening kind of simultaneously as pandemic, but independent of it. Yeah, so uh, as Randy indicated, in March of 2019, the, the government announced that they were going to require that students um, have four online learning courses in order to graduate from high school. Um, for folks that are you know, the Americans among the audience, um, it's worth noting that Ontario is the, the largest and most populous province. Um, at the time of the announcement, there were about 600,000 public school students uh, in the, 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 the province, or sorry, 600,000, um, 630,000 um, secondary students in the province to give you sort of a sense as to what the scope would have been. Uh, they backed that up a little bit in November of 2019, indicating that they were only going to require uh, two in order to graduate from high school. And in addition to the guidance that Randy's posted there, uh, one of the things that they've decided is they've decided that it came into effect the fall of 2020. So for all of the students that uh, essentially started uh, their freshman year last year, um, so they've counted 2020-21 as you know, the remote learning that the students experienced last year, regardless if it was online or hybrid or what have you, that all students would be given credit for one of those two online courses uh, for what they experienced last year. Uh, for the Americans in the audience, we know that um, you know, this is something that we've seen in the U.S. in the past. Uh, right now, there are uh, six jurisdictions that have some kind of requirement around this. Um, we know that at one point there were 13 in total that had this kind of uh, requirement, um, and we've since seen many of them back off of this, but there's still six on the books. Um, and, and as Randy noted, Michigan was the first, and uh, for those that are keeping track, it was announced back in 2006, came into effect for the freshman class of 2009 that this was going to be policy. Um, so, you know, it's not like these policies are new in any respect. Um, you know, it's been well over a decade that we've seen them in the US. Thank you. And, and I wanna go back to a notion, I think that Frank, that you brought up as well. And, um, you know, in terms of centralized versus decentralized, and Michael, can you all, maybe you can comment on that a little bit in terms of what's happening between the Francophone and Anglophone boards in Quebec in the same way. But, uh, you know, Todd had made a point that the reason why they're collaborating right now with is there's the Ministry of Education in Ontario has centralized one learning management system. So they're using D2L's Brightspace for that. And they also have built content. They've also leveraged now TVO and TFO, TV Ontario and, and the Francophone equivalent for that, uh, that traditionally offered correspondence. They're now building online courses specific to fit within D2L's Brightspace environment. So there has been a centralized approach 
which uh, again, interestingly, uh, is that Alberta went away from that. Um, so, and, and I'll just talk briefly about British Columbia, which as Joel mentioned, didn't ever have a province-wide shutdown so that they put it in the hands of the locals, so to speak. And I have to say from a political point of view, our public health officer calls the shots, not the politicians. And that's not always the case in other jurisdictions. We see the same thing play out in the US and different states. Some are following uh, health authorities who take the lead and others are working in conjunction with them, shall we say loosely, um, for that to occur. Um, but in British Columbia, because they said, we don't like this remote learning thing, or for whatever reason, as a policy, we're not going to talk about that, but we will close schools and they have to extend the classroom and that's okay. And they have used the term remote learning, but as a policy mechanism, they said, you're either going to go into an online school or you're going to stay in your school because schools are open. That's the place where they need to be. And they didn't really get into this cohort driven model that Joel, you, you were talking about. They did have in secondary schools when they had to reduce or they did have outbreaks. They did use cohort uh, model throughout the last school year. This school year as a policy decision at the ministry, they said, no, they're not going to use a cohort model because that's created the dissonance that teachers are feeling of trying to have two different audiences at the same time. So uh, very different pieces, but British Columbia also has centralized now. They've also got a central uh, provincially uh, offered LMS. And so there's affordances of support that are coming around how when ministries can bring collective monies together to support things, because Ontario has had a very robust history with online learning uh, for that. But let's flip back to Quebec, Michael, and tell us a little bit about centralized versus decentralized francophone and anglophone. Uh, well, let me just give a little background. In Quebec, um, online education is still not officially recognized. And, uh, Technically, you're not even legally allowed to do it, uh, even though they've asked teachers to teach online, and we've been doing it since 1999. So um, uh, they, they're trying now to, uh, I don't know what it is, centralize, control a little bit more what's going on, uh, and they are asking people to put forward pilot projects for online education so that they can assess whether it's a, a viable form of education or not. Uh, delivering that uh, instruction to students. It, it's, it's really ironic because we've had a very, very progressive curriculum, but when it comes to online, they still refer to it as formation and style, so it's a distance education, um, and they still have these very arcane uh, notions. Um, there's no coherence either. There, the vast majority, 85% of the population here in Quebec is uh, francophone, about 15% is uh, Anglophone, English speaking, and um, there's no real coordination or coherence between the two. We are trying to um, get together some kind of plan and uh, and collaborate, but the ministry it really doesn't make it very easy. And we're going through um, uh, interesting times, as they say. So it's uh, I think the the future for online education in Quebec uh, going forward is a little murky. Uh, I, I don't know exactly where we're going to end up. It's, uh, as I said, rather ironic because uh, uh, they will call on teachers to teach in, in an emergency situation to teach online, or they'll call on us to provide online classes to students with medical exemptions, but they don't officially recognize online education. So um, it really leaves us all in a, in a bit of a, a quandary. Where are we going? What? How do we uh, respond to all this? We're simply going to go ahead and keep doing what we're doing until uh, we get slapped on the wrist and told that uh, we have to stop. So it's a little bit of a, um, we'll uh, uh, go, we won't ask for permission and we'll beg for forgiveness later. Uh, and that just seems to be the, the overall plan as the, um, the ministry tries to come to grips with some kind of uh, idea to what they want to do with online education. I'd like to tell you there's a little bit more sensible approach to it, but that's just the reality that we're living with currently. <laughs> Anyone on the panel to chime in? And again, for the audience that's watching the streaming piece, it's difficult for us to interact with you, but we really would appreciate you poking us with some questions 
or making some comments to to let us know uh, where and how. Um, but I'm curious in terms of we've had such a mixed um, sort of response from the different jurisdictions across our country. Uh, and there have been mixed responses in other locations uh, because of that. But what we're trying to do is that we're working with our partners at the Ministries of Education to try to get some data that will support things. Um, there was a, a leadership panel that I attended uh, that was run by someone else where I listened to the deputy minister uh, in Nova Scotia who is sort of the, other than the politician, informs the politically appointed minister, uh, but is the deputies are your, your senior leadership within the, the, the government ministry itself. Talk about how Nova Scotia did set guidelines for, and we have some evidence now that's coming in of data, uh, that online learning, remote learning, when they did it, uh, needed to be both asynchronous and synchronous. So it was not Zoom school, so to speak, uh, within their their approach, and they did set guidelines. Well, it's interesting, Nova Scotia, though, did have um, regional school boards, and they consolidated in to create one oversight from the actual ministry itself through all of K-12 education. So I don't know, Mr. Barber, if you have anything else you want to add as background to that, but that changed the landscape to a certain extent, whereby they, as a ministry, started to make pedagogical decisions and provide supports for teachers more directly. Uh, I, the only thing I would add to it, Randy, is one of the things we've seen in the annual State of the Nation studies over the last really five to eight years is that the province in Nova Scotia have really done a concerted effort to promote the use of online learning tools in their classroom teaching practices. Um, so they, they, they got teachers into the provincial LMS. They got both teachers and students access to the content that they had been creating. Uh, they've been doing a lot of training around the use of Google Classroom. So for many of the teachers, um, that I guess idealized vision that many of us had back when this first started and by many of us, I mean, many of us in online learning thinking that, you know, well, for the last number of years, folks have been using more and more technology in the classroom and now they'll just leverage that when they go home and, and everyone will see what a great job, you know, that they can do. And this will be a wonderful boom for online learning. Um, you know, Nova Scotia were actually positioned to actually be able to sort of uh, come closer to achieving that utopic vision than a lot of jurisdictions were. And, and, and while Randy indicates as we're getting, you know, getting the data a little bit, um, uh, you know, coming in on this, um, so we'll be able to look at it a little bit better. Uh, I'd argue that when you look across the country, they were probably one of the better jurisdictions in terms of being able to have that sort of seamless flow. Yeah, well, I, I think it's there. And this is where we're trying to bring some <clears throat> other information. Now, it, I put in the text chat Ruth's question about, you know, speaking to effective pedagogy for online. We'd, we'd like, we have our own opinions, but we'd like to get actually data and research to support uh, what we've seen. So when we look at Nova Scotia, uh, when we look at Ontario, that's now collaborating with boards who are delivering the education on uh, being a, a central part of that. Whereas before they were making policy decisions independent of that, we certainly see a trend about how that might happen in Nova Scotia. In, in British Columbia at, this, at the same time as well, is that the deputy minister that I listened to said attendance increased last year, the last school year, they have records. And I said, where's your records? <laughs> How did that happen? But contrary to what you believe, the attendance increased because they found fewer sick days that students were taking as they normally did. But they did have school outbreaks where everyone was away from the school for a short period of time, but came back and because of the health situations and regulations. Now, that's the statement that was made by a deputy in a panel online. I'd like to substantiate that because if that's the case, then what BC is doing speaks more importantly to what might be effective online pedagogy that was happening during those, those breaks as well. But 
Can anyone in the panel who you are doing uh, a lot of work on this speak to that one about what's what's effective pedagogy for online? Well, Particularly I, I don't know K-12. about yeah. I don't know about speaking about effective pedagogy per se, but I mean one of the one of the challenges has been to measure that in terms of the effective outcomes. And one of the the challenges we have in Alberta, we have a system of uh, uh, standardized provincial exams that are done in the grade nine and twelve years, grade six and three as well, but but nine and 12 are the sort of the heavy hitting exams and they have been put on hold time and time again. Understandably so. I would not argue for one moment that we should be having those kind of standardized tests at a time when um, health is at issue. The problem is, is that it, it removes a data point for us because us as an online school, we have been intentional in our design for, for years, for decades, and we have generally done extremely well on those particular metrics. And now we don't have any way of making that comparison and finding out where those gaps have occurred. So in terms of effective pedagogy, uh, we all read the research, we all know what it should look like. We've all seen the design uh, principles that have been uh, that have been circulated. But I mean, at the end of the day, there does need to be a measure. And right now, without having some sort of a standardized measure, it is difficult to, to say that this intentional delivery has been more effective than the emergency remote um, instruction that's been occurring. And that's the challenge I have. I can jump in here for a second. For the last, as I said, since 1999, what are we now, 22, 23 years, um, our students have been taking classes with us online. And they take the same exams at the end of the year. They're, they're called provincial, exa provincial exams here. And at the end of the year, our students consistently score, regularly score five to 10 points percent, percent above students in the, uh, in the regular uh, across the province. So we're, we're seeing that our online students uh, don't struggle, don't suffer. Um, we looked at our, our uh, uh, retention levels and uh, they're higher than the average. I mean, we've kept stats on this and we can tell you that uh, uh, done properly, it, it, uh, online education can be very effective. Um, we can always make these uh, this information available to anyone who's interested, but uh, for us, it's, uh, it's very clear. We've always also promoted a very collaborative uh, learning model, or try to be as socially constructive as is possible. Uh, and that's really maybe a part of the difference. We don't, uh, we really have pushed hard against a didactic model uh, and I think that that's part of the reason that we're successful uh, throughout uh, uh, the courses that we give online. And, and I'm going to go to you, Joel, but before you jump in, um, one of the other pieces of anecdotal evidence, and anecdotal in the sense that it, it's reported, it's not necessarily researched and validated in the same way, is that there's an increase of, uh, of students that are involved in online programs now because they've discovered that if students that have eye anxiety, the social issues, but also they're finding that the amount of social behavioral interruptions that occur in a school building and around there uh, are not as effective for many, many students that are sort of corralled to, to be in there. And they're finding now that working at home independently is something that it's a more of value for them. So the, the numbers that are anecdotal is that there's been a continued increase in the registrations and enrollments in online programs. The difficulty is, will that last post-pandemic? Joel, do you have some comments about your own experiences, either as a researcher or as a parent or anything else? Um, it's it's interesting. I, I um, for online, I worry about our, our students with diverse needs for sure, because I, I think that there are a lot of students, um, you know, if. Uh, my son has ADHD, and so online learning is, is quite difficult and quite challenging. And getting specific supports in those spaces, I think, is um, is is a bit of a concern as a parent. So when I when I think about, I think there, are, I do. It would be wonderful if if we could have these spaces for students who really are successful in these spaces to continue on for various reasons. Um, but it, it still poses a, a big challenge for, for a lot, especially, you know, when we're still helping our, our teachers 
um, understand and navigate through these online online spaces in terms of how do we, you know, one day you're face to face and you're tasked with one certain pedagogy and, and the next day all of a sudden you're back online and how do we then make that that super shift to a completely different kind of pedagogy and making sure that we're being responsive and attentive to all of our students and our students' needs um, is still, I think, something that we need to really work with. Yeah. Well, to add in, I, I do want to mention here because, I mean, you, brought, you bring up an interesting point, and that is there's no one size fits all. We all know that. I mean, this is not a delivery system that's for everyone. And what we as a school have been doing this past semester, given that we've got a very unique situation, we've got suddenly access to a number of students who may not have been with us before, we've asked them very directly, what did you do to be, um, what did you do to be successful? Give us your story. Please give us sort of a, a narrative about what you did to be successful so that we can share that out with other people and they can make an informed choice about whether this form of learning is right for them. And I think that that sort of student profile is something that would be really helpful in a lot of these settings. What, what was the student profile that was successful in this setting as opposed to this setting? Where, who was successful in asynchronous versus synchronous delivery? I also, um, I worry about how much synchronous time some jurisdiction, jurisdictions are mandating. So for, for Ontario, it's basically the same amount as you would have in a regular face-to-face -face school day. And so when we think about, um, you know, a good, we know good online learning is that when you're going to be doing something synchronous, it needs to be done intentionally and with purpose. And there needs to be some real thought behind doing that instead of just saying, okay, we can see each other. This is, we're, you know, let's just call this learning or, or whatever. And, and we know that that's not the case. And so I think a lot of teachers feel very bound by that requirement. Um, and I think we also need to um, offer some, some of our teachers as professionals, some agency to, to be responsive to our students and say, okay, this is what we're doing. And now we're going to be doing this offline or asynchronously so that when we come back, it can be something that's really done intentionally. I, I think that's, that's an important piece in the you know, bums and seats uh, or Carnegie unit, even way back when um, it was, was the model that parents grew up with and they understand. So to a certain extent, it's not just government, it's sort of parental expectations around that. So, you know, the roomies and zoomies kind of approach model is just uh, classroom pedagogy online. We know it's not necessarily effective, but also at the same time, we're going through curricular changes in K-12 to look for competency, independent learning, you know, more self-regulation for the individuals, because that's also what industry is asking for, for that to happen. So, so this is an opportunity. Um, the question is, is it an opportunity lost? And maybe let's wrap up our discussion is on that. Uh, and I will share, well, let's go around there and you start, Michael. Actually, I, I wanted to just weigh in on that last point. And yep. I wanted to, because Frank had said something that, that touched on one of the things I had, I was going to mention, um, you know, Frank indicated, you know, that online learning is not for everyone. And I think, I, I would disagree with his sentiment, but his sentiment is a good example of actually what I was going to say. Um, one of the things I think Canadian programs have done a really good job at is they've recognized what they are designed for, or more specifically, what students that they were designed to address. So unlike what we saw historically in the U.S. where you had you know, statewide supplementals or, or the full-time cyber charters where they thought that they could use, you know, for all their, their raw, raw, but personalized and individualized instruction, really it was a single delivery model that was there. And the only personalization was the level of support you got based on how much you demanded of them. Canadian programs have done a much better job that said, you know, like we're going to design this particular program to address the needs of these students. And in many cases, you see a lot of districts, particularly at West, where the same district has like three and four different online programs. 
And oftentimes that's because each of them were designed to provide learning for a different type of student. And when you actually look at how each of these programs are designed, delivered, and supported, you see significant differences based upon the types of students that they have. You know, I know Michael has several programs that they run through LEARN, and while they all fall under this umbrella of LEARN, they all operate very differently and provide different levels of support and different modes of delivery, depending upon what the student is trying to get. And I think that's one of the things that Canadian programs have done very differently than, than what we see in our U.S. counterparts. And I think it's been very specific along the way. And I think it speaks to the levels of success that you heard Randy and Michael talking about. Because when you look at a particular group of students and say, okay, how do we design a program, regardless if it's online, blended, hybrid, face-to-face, -face, whatever, but how do we design a program that's specific to the needs of this group of students? Of course, you're going to have more success than what they have in a general classroom where the, 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 the poor teacher's got 25, 35 kids in front of them, and they've got to try to figure out how to meet the needs of this wide range of stuff. Um, you know, so I think that that purposeful nature of setting up programs to address specific needs is one of the reasons why you can hear the folks here talking about the, the, the high levels of success that they've had. And they are truly high levels, not just because of, you know, the fact that they're creaming students off the top. And, and I, I would just chime in, Joel, on your comment about, you know, the requirement about, the, you know, the synchronous activity that the teachers have to generate for students if they're not even in the classroom, is that um, what bodes well for me and knowing about Ontario is the fact that now the mandatory e-learning requirements for courses are coming through the boards with the practitioners. So, I mean, I, I do want to say in the hands of a well-trained, supported teacher, they know best and do best for, for students. And that's the model which we grew up with and have, which is put a good teacher in a classroom with a bunch of students around them, they'll make magic. Uh, but if they've got a bad design and pedagogy, said the secondary science teacher who taught, uh, you know, really lower end kids in grade five and screwed it up completely to the point where I wanted to quit. And then I went, wait, I'm still a good teacher. I'm just doing the wrong things. And then I figured out what were the right things to do, ask for help first, then figured out what the right things. So I think in online, I think that's our solution. That's what we need to do. And we've heard this throughout DLAC for those of us who have gone to sessions about that community, about that networking, about having models and having sort of uh, other pieces. And that's also in the design principles that we've, we've seen. So. Um, we're going to probably start to wrap it up, but I want to go around the room and make sure everyone's said their piece. Maybe just one last thing for me here, and I'll keep quiet after that. Just to piggyback a little bit on what has been said, is, uh, in our um, online school for the medically exempt students this year, we have uh, students with a wide variety of uh, learning challenges. Some of them are actually in hospitals and uh, uh, undergoing chemotherapy. I mean, the range of uh, problems is just vast. And what we've been able to do is actually bring together teams of teachers to work with uh, these students. Uh, some of them are mildly autistic on, on the spectrum, pardon me, and uh, uh, others have reading challenges. Uh, we've actually had our teachers start learn themselves because they weren't used to doing this, work uh, in a collaborative fashion with, with other specialists um, to try to address some of these uh, uh, issues and challenges within the uh, uh, the, the school. We also had to train our teachers on how to use assistive technology, you know, those with the uh, uh, visual impairments. So a lot of different things that ha come, come uh, into play, but we, we had to adjust our, our, uh, our approach and get our teachers to learn all this. So it's a, a challenge on many levels, but uh, I think um, when with the right mindset, we can, uh, we can do a lot of different things. And finally, just the online learning may not be for everyone, but the uh, brick and mortar is not for everyone either. Joel, any final comments? No, I've I've enjoyed the conversation. It's you could we could keep going, I think, and uh, go down that rabbit hole for sure. Absolutely. And Mr. Barber. No, nothing for me. I know uh, anything I would have normally said to clue up would be 
state of the nation kind of stuff. And we had, you know, folks in the audience for that yesterday. So if they were really interested in that, they would have went to that session yesterday. Exactly. So Frank, over to you. Sure. Thank you, Randy. And uh, first of all, a note of appreciation to Michael Barber. Um, pretty obviously, I, I walked into our own trap in that online learning is too broad a, a conversation to say right or wrong. It's this notion of, if, if I can contrast the national identities, whereas um, the U.S. has very much a melting pot uh, approach to um, society, the Canadian experience is one of a cultural mosaic. And I think that's what we see in online learning in this country is different programs designed to do different things and, and having success with that. To that end, um, as Randy mentioned, we do have a national organization called Canny Learn. That information is up there for you to have a look at. I'm very honored to, to chair the board of directors for that organization and to be involved with these um, very knowledgeable and um, expert uh, individuals who have looked at and helped guide online and distance education across this country. And so I want to thank everyone for, for coming today. And uh, I invite you to uh, contact us with your questions. I invite you to, to come to our website and, and have a look at what we do. And um, beyond that, I think, Randy, if there's any other comments, I will defer to you. No, I think that's it. Thank you, folks who are watching the recording. And thank you very much to this panel. Very much appreciate it. Have a good afternoon, all.